and uh, well, welcome to the numerous audience here. Um, before I start, if any questions come up, feel free to interrupt me. Let's discuss more than me talking. And I don't like the idea of just answering questions after the presentation and then circle back to maybe right. slide three or four. Let's keep it open. So if anything comes up, just a show of hands, and I'm willing to uh, take a break. Anyway, short uh, history of myself. Yeah, I'm not just looking that way, but I am an old timer in terms of doing open source and free software. All these dates here are uh, when I started as a developer. So uh, I'm doing a lot of things th for the more than 20 years now. And as brief, that's my uh, professional background. Since 2000, working for a company, no worries, it's not a marketing pitch here, just so you get an, uh, the impression that I do know what I'm talking about, actually. So we are, we are a company supporting open source, doing a lot of services for open source, Postgres in particular, but also a lot of other open source bits and pieces. And that not just in Germany, where I come from, as you can probably tell from my accent, uh, but also all over the place. Again, another list here. And let's b directly go into the topic. So what I did is I had a look at what kind of market share we as an open source in general get. Started with a standard thing in email. And as you can see, on the left-hand side, we have the um, MTAs. On the right-hand side is uh, IMAP servers. Almost everything here is open source. Not really surprising because it's the internet and open source has always been very close, but still. The same holds for web servers. Assuming that the Google web server or web servers, I don't know, are more or less based on open source, if not completely, it's again like three, fourth, three out of four web servers are open source. It's slightly different in databases. But not that much, actually. Um, yes, Oracle is number one, and we have Microsoft SQL with a large deployment base. But MySQL is on almost as much. And Postgres, well, it's getting a fair share. It's more than DB2 nowadays. Um, everything below DB2 is not really worth mentioning. Two points there that I find interesting is that Sybase, which is not exactly a, an, an unknown database vendor, and now owned by SAP, of course, is less than SQLite. And of course, I find it in, uh, interesting that Informix doesn't even show up anymore. So, so not the, survey the survey is, let me see, it should be on the, oh no, no date there. It's, um, I think the numbers were from 2012. 2012. I have to check that again. Um, I couldn't find really up-to-date numbers on the internet. Um, I guess nowadays MySQL will be less, Postgres will be more, but in general, open source might be on the same level. Yeah, like two Informix customers back and then migrating one of them away. <laughs> we, we've done a lot of Informix migrations throughout the years, but nowadays we see more Sybase migrations and DB2. Anyway, um, to make the sh story short, I could simply say, okay, that's it. We arrived. We made our way to the data center. Open source is a big piece for business IT. And if that is what you're looking for, like the essence, you're free to leave. But if not, well, let's start at the beginning. Oh, that's probably too early. Nobody ever, I guess nobody ever worked with this one here in the room. A little bit later. Anyone here who doesn't recognize both? Okay, so on your left side, that's Richard Stallman, kind of the, well, the founder of the free software movement. It's not really correct, but it's the one who really drove it forward. On the right-hand side, that's Linus Torvalds, the one who created the Linux kernel. And of course, there's this discussion whether or not it's a Linux operating system, because most of the tools we use are GNU tools, and of course GNU is what Stallman started. So these two are uh, really important for the whole free and open source software movement. 
Speaking of which, um, I'm not going into the details what is different between free and open source. I'm going to use both as synonyms. I'm, I'm well aware that there are small differences, but I don't think we need to discuss those now. So let me get another try. Get another try. Finally, we reach Berkeley. I'm pretty sure that everyone who's here knows that Berkeley has some meaning for the Postgres world. But if not, here are some more pictures. That might be more difficult to find out who's who. Um, anyone knows who's that, the gentleman on the top left? Uh, you were in uh, JD's talk, right? Um, yeah, that's Michael Stonebreaker, the one who um, yeah, started the Postgres project. He st uh, while back then, he was working for the University of Berkeley. He started Ingress first to find out what's possible and what we have to do in uh, relational databases, right about the time that Oracle was started, actually earlier than that. And after Ingress, he figured we know much, or we know everything about relational database. We want to learn more about object relational. Started a new project called Postgres, as in post Ingress. And it's really post. There is not a single line of code that he took over. This picture here, these six gentlemen are essentially the first, well, the first six of the community. There was a seventh called Byron Nelson, who disappeared even before the picture was taken or before I joined. You might have seen Bruce running around here. Well, you certainly have. <laughs> He's a bit older now. <laughs> Jan is here. And Vadim was here at least on Wednesday. I haven't, before Wednesday, I've never met Vadim in person. And when preparing these slides, I did check the, the old commit logs and found out I was actually, th this is Tom Lane, the one who did most of the source code, and I was actually the very next one getting commit rights on the Postgres source code after him. So I barely missed that picture. <laughs> this is a developer conference picture from I don't know when. Um, a lot of people are here. I can see Peter here, Josh here, Joe Conway somewhere there. So a lot of these guys are probably here today. What I want to do with this slide is just show you, we started with one, well, academic project, and now we have just a couple of the developers who meet in, I think it was Toronto. Um, and as you see here, the community is big. It's really big. The timeline, just briefly, um, already mentioned Ingress and Postgres. Not sure if you guys know that um, Stonebreaker actually managed to sell both, or make both um, proprietary to make both commercial. So there is a Ingress, there was a company called Relational Technologies, then acquired by CA and then brought back to life as Ingress again. And with Postgres, the same, started a company called Illustra that was then acquired by Informix. So a lot of the features we saw in Informix in the later versions were actually Postgres. So we started out with this academic project, created uh, an open source community around it. But how did we make it to the data centers? So I figured, yeah, it's easy. Just get the route between Berkeley and some place in the Silicon Valley. If anyone ever tries checking that, I have no idea if there's a data center. The one up front, uh, on the top is really Berkeley. The other one is somewhere in Mountain View. I have no idea. It might be residential. But anyway, I'm, I'm not a native of the Bay Area, but I wouldn't have taken this route. Being more of a touristy guy, I would have gone over Bay Bridge and not over, what is it, the Barton Bridge or whatever the name is. I would have stopped at Treasure Island, enjoyed the side of San Francisco. Um, maybe some locals would as well roadblock, lines, traffic jam, whatever. Um, and that, that showed me one thing. Open source is absolutely similar to that. It doesn't always take the high road. It's not the easy way just straightforward. 
but as open source, we did arrive in the data centers. Let me give you a little bit of um, information about the history of how we made it. Um, and speaking from my own experience, coming from a country that got into open source, I'd say five to 10 years earlier than yours. This is a, um, a drawing from a solution we did for a couple of customers in 2003, well, the first one. They needed software, or let's say they needed a complete system to scan emails for them, uh, spam, viruses, and so on, incoming and outgoing. And this had to be up 24 seven, of course. One of the customers is the German Meteorological Service and they even send storm warnings via email. So they cannot afford to have the system down, not even for a couple of minutes. And we created a full open source solution for that. All of the bits and pieces in there are part of the, the corresponding open source projects now. So if you install the, the software packages from Debian, from Debian Archive, you get exactly that. Um, it's a whole cluster. And you might imagine, I mean, I mean it's a big cluster, it used to be a big cluster and still is. Uh, one of the versions we have was supposed to handle 17,000 emails per minute in 2003. And just do the math and check back what kind of lines we had in 2003. That was quite a bit. You cannot get 17,000 emails per minute over. Uh, Out, not just on us, but also on the open source world, because this whole system has a total downtime of naught, not a single second downtime. We did change all the software pieces, we did change all the hardware and everything, but the cluster as it's such is running for 12 years without end. Do that with proprietary software, with closed source software. Good luck. So what happened then? I mean, yes, they were early adopters doing that, and stuff like internet infrastructure, like emails, always has been very much geared towards open source. But what happened is open source kind of moved up the stack. So people started with the infrastructure like mail and web servers, and then all the languages came up that people used to do websites like Python, Perl, Ruby, whatever. They're all open source, right? And so quite naturally, a lot of the um, well, web systems are completely open source, like e-commerce systems and everything. And then people realize, well, I'm trusting open source to run my shop. Why shouldn't I trust open source to run my data? So it went, we went down the stack again and finally arrived at databases. And of course, what's the most, basic, most important application there? It's ERP systems. So what, why has open source been able to make such an impact? And there are some reasons from businesses. Um, we ask our customers, but we also participate in the future of open source survey. You probably know about that, Mark, but I'm not sure if anyone else ever heard about it. Um, these numbers are a little bit older. The current one has been run already. There's a survey run every year where you just get a, a web form uh, and you answer questions and then they get, uh, they, they find, try to find out what's going on in open source and why are people going into open source and what should come next. Very interesting numbers there. So I think those are 2013 numbers and I just looked up the top three reasons why business went into open source and why p business are using open source. Interesting enough, there is no item license cost in there anymore. There are so many other advantages that bring much more to the table than license costs that people don't worry about that anymore. Um, software quality used to be something like fifth place, 2011. Uh, it's now number one. It's interesting. Let me briefly go through those three points uh, in a little bit more detail. 
Anyone here ever worked with this? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a Commodore C64. Actually, my second computer was like a, a revolution. 64 kilobytes of data. Yes, that's kilobytes. The one before that had 3.5 kilo. Um, first time I brought this, uh, one time I brought this slide up in a presentation, uh, a guy approached me afterwards and said I had tears in my eyes when I saw that old thing again. We, we used to call it a bread box. Anyway, um, it's, it's one single piece of computer. Everything is solidly soldered in there. There's no way to change pieces. Now just assume your database is like the memory. There is no way to get other memory in there or more than 64. If you needed more than 64 kilobytes, yes, you bought the next generation computer. You cannot change it. It's not flexible in any means. Just assume you're fine with that computer. Your software works well. The processor is fast enough. The audio is great. The video is great but you just need more memory. Not possible. Simply not possible. Open source is more like these. Well, you need more memory, yeah, fine. Put another one in there. You need a larger disk, fine. Take out the smaller one, put the larger one in. It's very easy. And as I said, it's the same for open source. If you run a system with, let's say, that ERP system, you have a, uh, an e-commerce system on top and the database, and you want to replace your ERP system, you don't have to update the database at the same time or vice versa. If it's open source, worst case, you have to recompile it against the older version. But you don't, you're not forced to do anything, which in the closed source world is not exactly the case, at least not always. In terms of vendor login, um, this is not just about license and cost and closed source code. Um, did anyone ever think about data formats? There are actually files out there that nobody can read anymore. There are files in a format belonging to a company that went bust. And now the documents are gone. There's no information about that data format. No way you can ever figure out what's in there. Now think about it as well, there are government regulations, at least in Europe, where some industries have to store data for 50 years, 5-0. I have no idea. Anyone want to wager a guess how computers look in 50 years? Well, I guess that. I wouldn't want to. But we have to make sure that data is still there. How can we do that with closed formats? And even if it's a big company defining the format, okay, so what? Big companies can go bust as well. Um, so it's, it's really ridiculously important to have open formats, open standards. Uh, I, well, probably a decade ago, I don't know, a while ago, I was doing some time on a, on a trade show promoting open source when um, a sales rep from a well-known company approached me and talked to me about office software. And he said, yeah, the biggest problem, of course, with uh, like Microsoft Office and LibreOffice, is incompatibilities. You don't get the formats as, as they should be. And he told me, yeah, that's, we got a XML now. Uh, you, in my opinion, the open office, or whatever the name back then was, developers are just too stupid. We have XML, so they can just read it. I said, yeah, if your XML was open. But you're using binary blobs, and you don't tell us what's in the binary. So even if it looks like it is open, it still isn't. Um, make sure that you're in a situation where you really get your data and keep your data and you're the one handling or making the decision where the data is stored. So you can move it elsewhere. And then the same thing, of course, um, make sure you use software that has a community and not one vendor who's just willing to give you bits and pieces as open source because that vendor might change its strategy as well. Wouldn't be the first time. As for quality, classical waterfall model. Any, anyone here a software developer? Okay, so you guys know about the waterfall model. 
I hate it, to be honest. I don't think this one can deliver good software. And it's not really used in open source. What's the problem? The problem, a waterfall is a one-way street. You need people to do the requirements and then other people do the design. There's nothing in there that feeds back. So what happens essentially, let's look at Niagara Falls, a real waterfall. <laughs> You're from there? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I took that picture, well, six years ago. But anyway. Um, yeah, I would have loved to go there this winter to see it frozen. Yeah, we had a fairly decent ice storage in like January or February. I only saw pictures of that. I would have loved to see this big thing in, in ice. But what did they say? Ten, oh, ten stories high, the ice? Something like that. It's really cold, though, when that happens. It was negative 22 Celsius at the time. Yeah, OK, that's a disadvantage of that, I, I admit. <laughs> anyway, what you see in the middle there, what the waterfall really produces is mist, right? Now, the interesting thing for those of you who don't speak German, there's a German word called mist, same writing, M-I-S-T. The meaning, though, is completely different. The translation to English of the German word mist is crap. I always find that amusing. A waterfall produces crap. And this actually holds for software development. Um, not always, but unfortunately more often than not. In open source, you have the option to be part of the development. As a user, you don't have to develop your own source code. But you can talk to the developers. You can tell them, well, this is the way the workflow goes. This is what we need in terms of feature. This is what doesn't work. And yes, you're developing this software. We found this bug, whatever. Talk to us. Speaking as community, talk to us. Um, help us making the most out of the software. We can only have so many test cases, right? And everyone who's working on Postgres uses their own, usually even production database as well, in, on the test server, of course. Uh, to try everything out, but still we're limited. But you guys have a lot more. Try it out and then again, talk to us, um, learn to collaborate with us. It gives you better software, it gives us options to create better software. It's a win-win. Brief word about security. It's, it's very interesting because um, a lot of people called it a liability for open source. And I haven't heard that for a long time until I made it my way to actually Saudi Arabia last year, where somebody brought up the old argument that uh, software that's open is inherently insecure because everyone can look into it. Well, it's actually the other way around. Everyone can look into it and find the problems. And most people from the industries realize that. We've seen a huge, how about you, Mark? Seen the same push? In Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. So we all agree. It's not just us as a company, but all the companies see that. That's where the security argument comes from, right? Yeah, it's right. The quality. It's just there's a thousand people working at it, not just five guys in PMG. So. Giving enough eyes, every, every bug is shallow or whatever Linus rule was. Yes, you have to have a lot of eyes, but still, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of companies. And I mean, we all agree probably which bus to take, if we want to take a bus. So the choice for business critical usage, I just brought up a couple points there. I'm not going to read them to you. Um, there are a lot of points that people really like that you, you like when using open source. Uh, and there's a reason why license causes at the end. So let's have a look at the cost structure for running software. Right? Because what you're interested in is not just license cost. What you're interested in is total cost of ownership, right? And this is, um, again, older data, but it's difficult to find the new one. Um, how total cost of ownership divides on the software hardware training, um, downtime, 
Yeah, uh, it's Staffia and Ms. Angelus. Um, if you were able to reduce the license cost to naught, you still only reduce the TCO to at most 7%. And that doesn't take into account that support and other stuff you also need for open source is part of the license cost in that model. So reducing the license cost itself doesn't make a huge difference. You can get almost as much from other aspects like training where there are a lot of cases where it's easier to train on open source on um, downtime because open source is in a lot of cases is more reli reliable. And also on the hardware side, because a lot of bits and pieces work on older, smaller hardware. But the real huge difference is the stuff requirements. You see it's like 60% is stuff cost. And there's a lot on the stuff that you see here. Um, a lot of things people have to do, and it really depends on how much work do you have to put into it. And a lot of these things make open source essentially cheaper because you have to put less work into it. One problem is there are published results for that, how much you can save. But still, a lot of people simply don't believe it. Or even don't believe that open source in itself is sustainable. I've been in that situation as a, personally, me, that people questioned the way that open source works. He literally told me, uh, as soon as these geeks develop a social life, they are gone and stop working on it. I was like, well, wait a moment. I'm married. I have three children, and I still do. It doesn't that qualify as social life? Yeah, maybe, but I don't believe it anyway. Okay. Um, unfortunately, that's the way it is. But of course, to get there and to figure it out, you have, well, the other way around. You cannot. Um, most people don't start from scratch. So you have to find a way to get there first, which is migration, of course. Um, but a migration in itself is, is an investment, right? So you have to find out how much do you have to invest to how, and how much can you save, ideally in advance. How this is measured is the return on investment. probably heard about that. The basic idea is how long does it take me uh, until my benefits are higher than the costs? So I essentially save money after my return on investment. And we did some math there. We took a lot of migration projects we did, mostly databases. Some are VPN or email. And kind of simplified it a little bit. Instead of having the license cost saving put into a yearly payment or by yearly payment or whatever, we put it on monthly payment. I'm pretty sure nobody pays licenses on a monthly base, but it makes it easier to show what happens. And as you can see, um, on the, the x-axis, you see the, the upfront investment in terms of whether well, those are euros. And on the y-axis, you see months for the return on investment. So even if the external investment, so the investment they had to put into an external contractor was seven digit, it's still only eight months until they recovered. And this is just the license cost. This does not include all the other advantages we have. Um, and yes, it's. The zero zero thing is actually true. I've been personally in a migration that cost them an additional time one hour. So that's an immediate return on investment. Unfortunately, it won't go that way all the time. How do we get there? This is a, this is a list of well, let's say bullet points you should keep in mind when doing migrations. Some are very obvious, like a capable, capable manager or a solid planning base. Some are actually not so. Oh, well, well, they might sound obvious, but people tend to forget it, like training and maintenance and support are involved. Um, redundancy has 
become better? The inter and temporary and isolated solutions, not exactly. Did anyone ever, did anyone ever put uh, an interim solution in a system? Still running? <laughs> um, when my wife and I moved to the second apartment together, well, first boy was born, second one wasn't, um, we were the first renters of that apartment. And after a couple of days, a fan in the bathroom broke. So we called them, they came in and fixed the spring that was broken in there on a Friday afternoon. Weekend comes, fan doesn't work again. So we called them again, they came on Monday, and the spring was broken again. And he was like, yeah, we didn't bring a new spring because we exchanged that the other day. So what he did is just get his pen out, open it, take the spring out, and put it into our fan. Said, well, this should work for as long as we need to bring the right spring. We never saw these guys again. We moved out of the apartment after four and a half years and the fan never broke down. It's probably still working on that spring or the fan. This is what happens. And yes, it's nice, it works. But think about it, you might have to do a migration again. And then you have this isolated system that doesn't make sense or may, might not even be documented. Good luck with the next migration. Don't forget that. Um, so these are, these are more or less generic rules. When we go into open source, we have some, let's say, additional requirements. How about licenses? It's not really easy to understand, um, well, let's say, the undergrowth of open source licensing. And no, it's not just for ISVs. There are a lot of situations where it might be important even for non-ISVs. There are situations where um, even using it on a, on a web creates problems. There are situations for us like Postgres project, we have to be careful. There's no way for us to accept GPL code, for example. Because once you put GPL code in, everything is GPL. Um, it's interesting, well, for lawyers. Do we have a lawyer here? Oh, that's good. <laughs> I talked about the same thing with the same slide on a presentation last year in India. And you could immediately see when I started talking about licensing, two guys getting these bright eyes, like, yes. Yeah, both were lawyers. They made a living out of it. It's, it's a lot of things, and yes, you have to worry about it. Um, I mean, basic incompatibilities are well known. So most of the stuff we have figured out. But that doesn't mean everyone has it figured out. A lot of developers simply chose to not care. Um, what is important to me is there are two things that I really want to bring out to the public. Um, there is no real license like public domain. Public domain is not a license. The only way for you, you or you to put something into public domain is writing it and then dying. You cannot assign it to public domain. With one exception, by law, stuff done by the federal government here in the US is public domain but only inside the US. So if you take that software out of the US, it's not public domain anymore. And if you write software, put stuff in there that's saying put into the public domain, it essentially carries no license. And no license or no license information is the most restrictive one of them all. You're not allowed to do anything with it. And there's another, well, let's say, another point of protecting your property, and that's a software patent. Um, while patents in itself are not a problem, software patents and open source don't really mix. Um, the patent idea, or the idea behind the patent is keep everything by yourself until it's finished, and then apply for the patent and then give it out. And this description alone should tell you it's not what the open source world is about. The open source world is about is sharing the software. 
And this is not just for the communities. The way open source development works has a great benefit for all companies for internal processes. There are a lot of things where companies internally develop like a lot of different software again and again and again because you don't know that the other department already did the same, for example. You don't get the same, let's say, quality of software because you don't have peer review and so on. There's a lot of things you can learn from open source as a software development department inside a company. And we should also learn about open source is, let's say, procurement divisions. You see a lot of tenders that say, okay, bring us the software, we do our tests, and if we decide your software is the right one, we buy it. That doesn't really work with open source. It's easy if they tender for a database because the database is there. But usually they tender for a solution. That means you have to integrate bits and pieces. And open source, you have to um, develop the solution, essentially. You cannot do that for a test case, right? But then, after we did it, it's already finished. The work is done. Um, so service providers. I kind of alluded to it a little bit that you're not locked to one. It's your choice. And I've seen customers really making the decision to change service providers, not because of, well, the service provider didn't work well, but just because they wanted to show their superiors it's possible. They're not logged in anymore. Okay, fine. As open source companies, we have no way of locking people in other than doing a good job. However, um, there are, well, there are companies that only claim to be open source or claim to understand open source. And of course, there's the community itself. I mean, the community, especially for Postgres, is what the software vendor is usually for its own software. But that is also an analogy that's not really 100% true. So what do you do about support? Yes, you can do the community support. Easy. Just send an email to hackers and somebody will take care of it eventually, depending on what the content is, depending on the way you word your email. But you cannot get the community to sign an SLA. And when it comes to well, communication skills between companies and open source, there are a lot of well, different ways you can do it. I mean, I, I'm, as I said, I'm still doing open source development myself. I get bug reports that are not in, well, I found this problem or I think this should run otherwise. They are like, this doesn't work, you have to fix it now. Why? You're not paying me. So why should I fix it? Besides, it's not even a bug. It's documented. It should work the way it does. Um, so what, what we, uh, as, as let's say, open source and Postgres companies do, is we have people who know both. We have people who know the, the business side of it, but also who know to work with communities, in particular Postgres, but also other communities. The language is different, the way you interact is different. And it's really important if you get to choose, there are a lot of companies to choose from, so it's not about marketing for one uh, and only one company. But make sure you get companies that really know what they are doing and that are not, well, trying to jump on the moving train, right? And have no idea about it. Well, in other words, you should make sure that you have, or that your suppliers, your contractors have specialists there who know what they're doing. And speaking of specialists, very simple thing, we don't have enough. We don't have enough Postgres specialists. Yeah, and I see everyone like, yes. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't really know how to fix that problem. I do know that it helped us to start actually teaching at the university. Um, but even for the people that do get to some, or get expertise in Postgres to some degree, how do they prove it? It's really, really difficult for them to do it because, yes, you can read a book about Postgres, but does that mean you're a specialist? 
No. But you can do some certification. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. But I'm not sure about all the certifications we have. Actually, I don't know how many. Do you have certification on Postgres? Is it on Postgres or is it on EDB? Postgres. OK. So we have at least one. I know that API Japan has one. Uh, but that's about it. I'm, I'm kind of wary of certifications. Personally, I do have a small history in quality assurance. And I think it was, let me check, ISO 9001. People were talking about all the time. And of course, this is a life vest, right? On the other side, we have concrete blocks. Which, which one would you want to have if you fall over or fall out and, and fall into water? It's easy, right? ISO 9001 allows you to build a life vest out of concrete. You can get that certified. It's actually easier to get it certified because you don't have to worry about a return process. Once they are used, they are gone. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Absolutely. But 9001 is only about your processes. How do you process the product? How do you process returns and so on? It doesn't say anything about the quality of the product, what it's supposed to do. Certifications like that don't make sense at all. And by that, I think, you don't have to worry about the two-minute warning. I'm done. And if my count is right, we got like 10 minutes for questions. So how do you say uh, the skill set or the resources required in Postgres API is available like in the market? Yeah. Is there any survey or like is there any data point that you um, there is no official survey, but you can easily do a survey. Just go to that room over there, uh, well, one level down. Talk to all those Postgres companies, or talk to the well, three companies in the room here, and ask people. I bet you, you will not find a single company saying, we don't have a problem there. Everyone I talk to says, yes, we'd like to hire, we'd love to hire, but we don't find anyone. I think that one of the problems that, that I've seen in general, and I, I'm no way uh, expert in Postgres, I do what I have to do, but uh, is the support. Um, it, it's, it's like you either use community or you know, it's consulting companies, right? So it's all or nothing. So either you do it free or you have to pay a consulting company that you don't know how long you're going to have a relationship with in order to you know, get support, paid support, or whatever that is. I wonder whether there is a middle ground there. Um, as, in, as in having stuff free and only? I, I don't want to say free, but like in, in a, in a, it's almost like you, you want to be able to work with someone, um, but, but it almost has that baggage. Like consulting companies would, would either be too expensive or they, they send mediocre you know, individuals and you know, stuff like that. So, okay, so, so if you. Postgres consulting in general has, doesn't have a good reputation. Uh, could be wrong. Well, I'm, I'm surprised Not about me. Uh, this is what this is what people tell me. So uh, yeah, no, I, I think I think that we're talking about the bandwagon problem here. Um, I'm pretty sure you, there are a lot of companies out there that have a very good reputation. Mm -hmm. I could easily name a few with a bad reputation as well. Uh, <laughs> you're probably thinking about the same right now. Um, Th there is a problem for you because you have to figure out which consulting company really knows what they're doing. But if you find out they do not, you can easily switch. Yeah. That's the big advantage. And you can go out and try the community solution and just go for that consulting company if the community solution doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of customers that say classical break fix and security support the community is fast enough, we don't need them to do it. But if we have a problem like we just deployed the latest version of our own software and now the database doesn't start up anymore. But it's 4 o'clock in the morning and people start using their cell phones at 6 and we need it for that. They need somebody to call and fix the problem in those two hours, right? And you cannot expect the community to do that. Oh, of course not. No, so what you, can do, what you can do is um, do both, and it's your decision which, which problem you send to the consulting company and which problem you send to the community. But 
I think the most important part is find out if that company really knows what it's doing. There are companies out there offering support in open source on an SLA base that have literally nobody on staff knowing anything about it. They have this network of specialists that don't have a, they essentially have them on retainer. So there's no SLA. You send the ticket, they will respond. They have the team to respond and everything. But do you get an answer on time? I don't know. And then there are other companies that have their own people that know the source code inside out. And they would certainly answer yeah. your question on time. I'm not saying it's guaranteed that you get the problem fixed in half an hour. That depends on the problem you found. Yeah, so, so to answer that, it's just basically mostly the separate individuals. There's not a single entity that you know, can. I don't, I don't yes. like dictatorship, but like, you know, people do look at, and again, it's all managers feedback, not necessarily mine, and uh, I differ from their viewpoint, but that's, they're the ones who sign checks, so. Yeah, the, the, the big difference is if you run like an Oracle system, right. it's easy, it's Oracle, they know yeah. their software, so go to them. With Postgres, there are a couple companies that are mostly on the same level, and it's your choice. I mean, you can easily take the cheapest one or the one that's closest right. to you. Um, you get more options. But the disadvantage, of course, is you have to do more due diligence yeah. and make a decision. But eventually, I'm pretty sure you get a better solution, worst case, with a second or third contractor. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? So then, thank you. Thank you. And uh, see you at the party.